All right, at this time now, we're going to ask Daniel Bennett if he'd read this morning's scripture for us. You can follow along in your Bibles, uh, Matthew 2, 1 through 12. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down, and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Thank you, Daniel. Something that shocked me the other day reading it, I didn't know I'd like to share it with you this morning. Did you know that the wise men were really firemen? I know, it sounds strange, but they really were. And I want to give you evidence of that. At least people living in the South believe that. Yes, the Deep South. Most people know that Christmas celebrates the birth of Jesus Christ. But they really do not understand as much as we think they do. In a small southern town, there was a nativity scene that showed great skill and talent had gone into creating it. One small feature bothered me. The three wise men were wearing firemen helmets. Totally unable to come up with a reason for it, I left. At a quick stop, On the edge of town, I asked the lady behind the counter about the helmets. She exploded into a rage, yelling at me, You Yankees never do read the Bible. I assured her I did. But she simply couldn't recall anything, but I simply couldn't recall anything about firemen and wearing helmets. So she was kind of outraged. She jerked her Bible from behind the counter, ruffled through its pages, and finally jabbed her finger at the passage, sticking my face in it. She said, see, it says right here, three wise men came from afar. I mean, how plain can it be, right? But when we think of the wise men, I think, of a search. Really, the search everyone embarks in in his life. And he may not realize that clearly as a search, but indeed, we're searching for that something to satisfy us, to fulfill our lives, that intangible something. We can't quite define it, but we know we haven't got it. Billy Graham, in his book, Peace with God, that he wrote in 1953, talks about this search very eloquently. Let me read that to you. It's from chapter 1. He quotes the verse from Jeremiah 29, 13. And ye shall seek me and find me 
when ye shall search for me with all your heart. You started out on a great quest the moment you were born. It was many years before you realized it. It became apparent that you were constantly searching, searching for something you never had, searching for something that was more important than anything in life. Sometimes you've tried to forget about it. Sometimes you attempted to lose yourself in other things so there could be time to think about nothing else. Sometimes you may have even felt that you were freed from the need to go on seeking this this nameless thing. At moments, you've almost been able to dismiss it completely. But always, you've been caught up in it again. Always, you had to come back to your search. At the aloneous moments in your life, You looked at other men and women and wondered if they too were seeking, if they too were searching, seeking something they couldn't describe, but they knew they wanted and needed. Some of them seemed so much happier and less burdened than you. Some of them seemed to have found fulfillment in marriage and family. Others went off to achieve fame and wealth in other parts of the world. Still others stayed at home and prospered. And looking at them, you may have thought, these people are not on the great quest. These people have found their way. They knew what they wanted and have been able to grasp it. It's only I, only me who travel this path that leads to nowhere. It's only I who go asking. Or does that awful hollow feeling persist? Does every further discovery of the magnitude of the universe comfort or make you feel more alone and helpless than ever? Does an antidote for human fear and hatred and corruption and lie in some laboratory test tube or an astronomer's telescope help you feel more comforted and satisfied in that search? There are other paths. And of course, many are traveling in them. There are paths of fame and fortune, pleasure and power. None of them leads anywhere but deeper into the mire. We are ensnared in the web of our own thinking, trapped so cleverly and some some completely that we can no longer see either the cause or cure for the disease That's inflicting us with deadly pain. If it is true that for every illness there is a cure, then we must make haste to find it. The sand in civilization's hourglass is rapidly falling away. If there is a path that leads to light, if there is a way back to spiritual health, we must not lose an hour. Many are floundering in this time of crisis and finding that their efforts are leading them not up, but only further down into the pit. Now, he gives these stats for 1952. Last year, the American people spent $125 million in fortune tellers. $125 $125 million by frantic, frightened men and women who are equally misguided to tell them the wrong answers to their questions. $125 million in 1952. In 2018, we had $2 billion spent instead of $125 million. Uh, Quite an increase. Last year, over 16,000 Americans who couldn't find even the wrong answers took their lives. 2016, we had 45,000 people who took their lives. Dear friends, the numbers are going up. People are searching for something that satisfies 
And I can't help but to believe these men from Babylon were searching, following that star, not only to answer the question of their studies, but the question for their life. Who they are, why they're here. What are the real answers to life? And as we look at these, we call them wise men or magi this morning, whether there were three or more, whether there were kings or not, there are lessons that they have for you and for me. And I'd like to look at some of them, starting at verse 1 and moving through the text fairly quickly, but thinking about perhaps what God is trying to tell us this morning through this precious portion of Scripture. It says, Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. And it reminds me that wise men say yes to God's direction. When I say men, and I'll use that frequently, I mean all of mankind. Wise men say yes to God's direction. And so it was with these wise men, they also said yes. So we see Jesus was born in Bethlehem. These wise men came in all likelihood from Babylon or Persia. And Herod the Great, a madman who would kill many in his family, was ruling, very jealous, very insecure. But God was working through all of this. God was bringing it together. Jesus born, wise men come from the east. Now these wise men, in all likelihood, were not Jews. They could have been, but in all likelihood, not Jews, but Gentiles. And it reminds us that Jesus came not only to save the Jews, but us Gentiles as well. Look at verse 2. When they finally came with the star, led them into Jerusalem. They said, where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star. Isn't it interesting? They didn't say we have seen a star. They said we have seen his star. They knew it was the star of the king. We have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Wise men say yes to God's directions. They also ask questions Good questions. Where can I find Christ? And dear friend, that is the most important question anyone can ask today. Where can I find the Savior? Where can I find Christ? Tell me where he is. Where is the one who's born king of the Jews? Well, today we know Jesus, where Jesus is. We can find him. He is readily available, but yet, nonetheless... Many will testify in their life before they found Jesus, their Savior, they went through a journey. They searched here. They searched there. They tried this. They tried that before they finally, finally found the Savior. And then they said, I have come to worship. Now, when we find Christ and realize who he really is, the natural response like Thomas, is to say, my Lord and my God, and worship him. The wise man says yes to God's direction. And God wants to give us as believers direction every day. Now, it might not be a star. He could use that. But most often, he uses the Bible. He wants to give us light. He wants us to give us direction. He wants us to follow him. How good are we at saying yes to his direction? But in verse 4, we read, But when the fullness of time, and that's in Galatians 4, 4, by the way, But when the fullness of time came, God sent his Son. You know, Jesus coming into the world was God's perfect timing. Was God's perfect timing. Uh, the Micah 5, 2 
when it talks about one to be born in Bethlehem, God's perfect timing was fulfilled. You see, God's in no rush. He may seem to be late, but he's always on time. He really is on time with bringing his son to us. God lives in the realm of no time. God lives in eternity. But yet at the same time, even though God lives in eternity where there's no time, he chooses to involve himself with us who live in time. And he came personally to live in time to be with us. God gave his very best. He gave his one and only son, his only begotten son. As a matter of fact, he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So timing conditions were perfect. I mean, we can even see that from a human perspective in the first century. Why? They had a common language, Koine Greek, which was spoken all over the Roman Empire. We had Roman roads that were well built, easy for travel to indeed spread the gospel. And we had Pax Romana, Roman peace, how the Romans stopped down any revolts and kept peace. So you see, God had his perfect timing in sending his son. And you know what? God has his perfect timing in your life and my life. Indeed. So as we remember that prophecy in Micah 5.2, But of you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the rulers of Judah, out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So the Messiah to be born would be a ruler and a shepherd. Isn't that interesting? We think of the wise men who came to visit him. They were shepherds, and as we've said so many times, in such a wonder, they came, these shepherds came to visit a shepherd. These shepherds came to visit the greatest shepherd of all, the shepherd of their souls, the one who would save them and redeem him. And Christ is called, indeed, the good shepherd, the great shepherd, and the chief shepherd in Scripture. Yes, He is the shepherd. So these wise men would find, yes, a shepherd. But they were looking for a king. Who is he that is born king of the Jews? Turn to Luke for a moment. Luke 1, 78 and 79. Beautiful prayer. And as we look at this prayer by Zacharias, it talks about, he says in 78, Through the tender mercies of our God, with which the day spring from on high has visited us. And he's talking about the Messiah. He's praying about his son, too, as well, John. But he's also talking about the Messiah. The Messiah is the day spring, the dawn of the Messiah, if you will, has come upon us to visit us. And look at what it says in verse 79. To give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. To guide our feet into the way of peace. How beautiful is that? And the wise men did see the light manifested in that star. They would come and find a baby in God's perfect timing who would rule. And also rule in every heart that trusted in him. And one day this baby, becoming a man, would one day rule the nations. They would find the fulfillment of the greatest promise. And where it began, right there, at his birth. They would find one who came to save them and give them a rich, abundant life. They would find the one that God had prepared for them to find. You see, God had prepared this for the wise men to find. Here are Gentiles coming into a Jewish country 
and seeking the Messiah. It seemed like they knew more about what was happening than the Jewish people did themselves. But God had prepared for them, these Gentiles, to see the face of Messiah. And so far as I know, they're the only Gentiles mentioned in the Christmas story that saw the Messiah's face. The first missionaries they would become going back east to spread the good news. God had prepared all this for them. How wonderful is that? It reminds me of 1 Corinthians 2.9 when Paul writes to the church at Corinth about what God prepares for us. He has so many wonderful things prepared for every believer. Eye has not seen, nor has ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things that God prepared for those who love him. But God reveals them to us through his spirit. So this long journey, over 500 miles in danger of robbers, weather conditions, they were willing to risk it all to follow that star, to find this king and to see what God had prepared for them to see. That one born, the king of Israel. You see, wise men follow his direction. Wise men follow his direction even in times of turmoil even when the enemy stands against them. They do not stop following God's direction. And they did have enemies. They had enemies they didn't even know about. Look in verses 7 through 10. And we see, indeed, the enemies right there. So when they finally came in Jerusalem and they asked the question, it was astounding to Herod and those in Jerusalem. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, go and search for the child. And when you have found him, bring him back word that I may too come and worship. And dear friends, we know he really didn't want to worship, did he? Very much. No, we know his plot and we know his plan. As a matter of fact, he was shook up, it says, in all Jerusalem with him. Everything was shook up. Why? You see, when light comes into the darkness, it shakes up the kingdoms of darkness. This baby was called a king, and he thought, I'm the only king. This baby was to be worshipped. I'm the one that is to be worshipped. And he was born right there where he was. He could not tolerate that. Another worldview. A light in the darkness. One that would undermine his kingdom. One that would take away from him his authority. And might I say today that the coming of Christ into the world and into our life shakes the kingdoms of this world today? They are shook up. They are rattled by the fact that that God has come into the world and that without him they're lost and that he is the only answer. And I tell you, some are responsive, but many, many will be in opposition to your message, which is really not your message, but the message of Christ. He tells us to bear and to bring. You see, it does shake up the wicked. And those who oppose God. And so it was. So what happened was Herod here plotted to destroy this baby already. The wise men had no idea of his plans. So he inquired of them, oh, when did you first see the star? When did it happen? And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I may come and kill him. Worship him. Yes, slip of the tongue. When they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star, which they had seen in the east, went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Isn't that amazing? 
When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Isn't that amazing? Here's the plot of the wicked wanting to snuff out the young Messiah, the young child. And immediately after he said those words, soon they saw the star. God was working. God was directing despite the opposition of the wicked. And really, this is Satan. It was Satan working through Herod. Because if this baby, if his life could end, if he could be put to death, he would never go to the cross and secure our salvation for us. So a tactic of Satan. He used that. Then he tried to get him later on, remember, to jump off the temple. Then even the Jews themselves tried to push him off a cliff. On and on, all these attempts in his life to prevent him going to the cross and providing salvation. So this was the very, very first. We see Satan working behind all of this to destroy his mortal enemy, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so it was. But we read in John 1, 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. It did not overpower it. Herod the deceiver, and indeed he was. And all Jerusalem was troubled, and he wanted to snuff out this child. God appeared to these wise men. The star appeared. God leads them despite the plot of the wicked king. For the wise men, God is working, despite the opposition. And dear friends, when you have turmoil, when you have opposition in your life, when you have difficult times in your life, God moves in and gives light, and he wants to lead and direct you in that, very much so. So for the wise men, God was still working, working through the deceptions of the wicked, Indeed. But look at verse 10. It says, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding joy. You know, that's the characteristic of the Christian life. Paul in jail says, rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. Nehemiah said, the joy of the Lord is my strength, having a relationship with God, and so it was in the Christmas story. When these wise men were deceived, or were they, God moved in. God directed, God helped them and assured them, I'm with you, don't worry. I've got this, I've got your back. I'm leading, I'm guiding, I'm directing. It's not Herod that calls the shots, it's me. It's not the devil who's going to win, it's me. We can see that there so beautifully. So when we follow the Lord amidst Satan's strategies against us, God will always, always show up and bring the light and give us direction and lead us to the Savior. Yes. There's a poem about the wise men written by a woman called Joyce Carr Stedbauer. I'd like to read it to you. I looked at a number of them, and I thought, to me, this was the best for all of you Bible scholars. She starts off by saying to the wise men, how do you know it was his star? Did you have ancient prophet scrolls to study? Were you perhaps Jews, descendants of Queen Esther's people, those who sat weeping and hung their harps in the willow trees? Did they stay behind when Ezra and Nehemiah led the return to Jerusalem? After the first Purim celebration, was business very good in Babylon? Did you debate what Isaiah meant when he wrote, A virgin shall bear a son, and ponder how to find Bethlehem in Judea, where Micah had spoken of his birthplace? Did you nightly search the blackened tents and deserted skies for the star that would soon rise out of Jacob? Well, there was no more wondering. 
Suddenly, out of the pit of night, radiance arose, brilliance beyond measure, without mistake, this was a supernatural star. Indeed, the day star. Friends call you foolish, hastily packing up for an arduous journey, preparing gifts for an infant king, a mission without precedent. The star moved, and you followed it with courage like Daniel. Dry days, lavish nights, under the star-struck sky, until Jerusalem appeared like a golden city descending out of heaven. And the star stood over a stable. Yes, Isaiah, Micah, your directions were accurate. A star did rise out of Jacob from the house of David. Wise men still near before the king of kings. Mm. And then wise men following God's direction will always lead us to his son. Wise men who follow God's light, God's direction, will always lead them to his son Jesus. Look at verse 9. We want to zero in on that. And when they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, and it came and stood over the place where the young child was. Those seeking God, you shall seek me with all your heart when you do this, you will find me. Those seeking God will always be led to his son. Now, God may not use a star. He may use other people. He may use a gospel track, a radio, TV program, whatever. But most of all, and most often, God uses his word. And he will always bring you to his son. Well, you say, why is that? Well, his son gives the answer. No one comes to the Father except through me. Indeed. And as we follow the light that God gives us daily in his word, it will always bring us to Jesus. Wise men worship, and they give themselves and what they have. That's true worship, the giving of yourself. Look at verse 11. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child and Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshiped. And when they had opened up their treasures, they presented gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. They saw, they saw what they had been seeking these many, many months on this dangerous voyage. They fell down. Indeed, they said in their hearts, my Lord and my God. They worship the one who is worthy of all of our worship. They presented gifts to him. It all belongs to him. What we have, he's given to us anyway. Remember that song, I Surrender All? And they did. They surrendered who they were and what they have. And that's the greatest thing of all. Dear friend, this Christmas, you can bake a birthday cake for Jesus. You can sing happy birthday, Jesus. And that's a great thing to do. But you know what? The greatest birthday gift to give to Jesus is you. To say, Lord, I give you myself. I surrender all. Please forgive the poor wrapping, Lord, but I give you me. That's the greatest gift. You see, he wants your heart. He wants you. They gave of themselves and what they had. And then in verse 12, then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Wise men heed God's warnings. And dear friends, all through scriptures, the scriptures are replete from Genesis to Revelation with warnings that God gives his saints. Telling us to walk in the straight and narrow. Warning us about danger. As he did with these wise men. He warned them in a dream. And they departed to their country a different way. They were safe from harm. 
They were saved from deception. They were saved from sorrow. And dear friends, when we follow God's warnings that he gives us in his word for us, we save ourselves so much sorrow and grief. You say, oh, if I only would have listened to God. If I only would have followed his word. It says that. I know it says that. But no, I did it my way. Good name for a song, by the way. So, heeding his warnings. And they do that, and they do that well. And let that be a practice in life. To always heed the warnings of God, because he tells us that as a loving father. And when these wise men went back to Babylon, they went back home, and they were changed forever. They were never the same. They had met God incarnate. Whether they fully understood it or not, they had met God incarnate. Their lives were changed. You see, we like the wise men before we knew Christ. And even after we know Christ, we're still exploring him. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. But we like the wise men. We're on a journey seeking something that we knew that we were missing. Something was missing in our life. And then we came to the end of our journey. And we found Christ. And that was the beginning of a new journey. Getting to know him better, more intimately. All of our life. He's the only one that can satisfy the yearnings of our heart. So what have we said? We've said quite a bit. The wise men said yes to God's direction. God used a star. Today he uses his word to direct us, to guide us in the journey of life that he's planned for us. Indeed, you know, we don't like the idea of Having yes men. Oh, he's a yes man, right? Says yes to everything. But boy, I'll tell you, when it comes to God, being a yes man, a yes woman, a yes boy, a yes girl, that's okay. And recommended. That's what really counts. They trusted in his perfect timing. In the fullness of time, God sent his son. And everything that happens in our life as we walk with him is in God's perfect timing. And we can trust him for that. They discovered what God had for them to find. A relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. And dear friend, in the Christian life, God has prepared a lot for you to discover. And he wants to show you day by day what he has prepared for you. Oh, not only in the life to come, but this life right here. God has much to show you, much to reveal to you, much to encourage you with, much to bless you with. Are you willing on that journey to trust him? They experienced following God's direction despite Satan's traps and opposition. That God always shows up bringing the light. And dear friend, as you live for Christ, you're going to have opposition Satan is going to be ultimately working behind it, but that's okay. That star will show up. That light will show up. God will give you direction through his word, and he'll bring you right where he wants you to be. Don't worry one bit. You see, following that light that he gives us through his word will always bring us to his son Jesus. Always. They experienced worship in giving, and the meeting of the Savior. And dear friends, that should be a picture of our life. Giving and worship. That should characterize our Christian life. They learned to heed warnings, and it saved their life. They learned to heed warnings. Are we learning from this every day for our safety and for our spiritual growth? And as we said a moment ago, They were changed forever and never the same again. Have you been changed? I hope so. If not, you can come to the Savior this morning. Say, Lord Jesus, I'm lost. I'm on this journey. I don't know 
what it is that I'm looking for. But I think it's you. So I'm going to come to the cross and trust you. Take away my sins. Give me new life. Make me your child. You see, when that happens, the journey ends. But only begins again in him as a fresh, new, wonderful journey, knowing our blessed, wonderful Savior. Not only for time, but for all eternity. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the lessons that we learn from these wise men. And we thank you that we have met you on our journey. Indeed, and you save, and you satisfy, and you're all that we need. Lord, speak to every heart here today with what has been said, and may it draw us closer to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.